Politicians in Washington tell you that free trade will make your lives better. Politicians in Washington tell you, trust them, and they will forge agreements with other countries that will enrich the farmers in the surrounding counties and that will make your factories boom. Well, you look back at NAFTA and you understand what's wrong with the politicians. They don't live in places like Lima, Ohio. They don't understand the dynamic in a place like this. They don't understand that back in 1995 and 1996, the factory started, started to say, oh, we're not hiring anymore. And then they started to lay off. And then dad started to have to get an extra job at the gas station, or maybe a job down at the new Target store or the Walmart. People are piecing things together. It's hard to pay for college and health care anymore. And so kid comes of age, whether well, you can't walk down to the factory to get a job and you can't go to college, you can't afford it. So you sign up for the military because it's a way to get a college degree. And now that kid who just wanted a college degree or would have loved to have worked in the factory making a car, making something useful for people, that kid is sitting in a desert in Iraq without body armor because the politicians in Washington didn't care to give it to him. He says, you understand that it is all linked together. Our trade policies create a foreign policy, an immoral foreign policy that uses the children of Lima, Ohio, who used to work in factories and on farms as cannon fodder in wars of empire around the planet. Sherrod Brown dared to utter those radical words, and you want to know what happened? He won Lima with twice the percentage that John Kerry got. And Sherrod Brown wasn't alone. In, in 2006, six Republican incumbent U.S. senators were defeated, and Democrats, or Democrat-friendly independent Bernie Sanders, who is a fantastic member of the Senate, won U.S. Senate races, nine new U.S. senators coming in. And if you track the, and our media doesn't cover trade policy. If it did, this would be a big story. But it, their stands on issues, if you were to track, what was the one thing that they had absolutely in common? It wasn't the war in Iraq. They had a lot of different positions on that. The one thing they all had in common was every single one of the nine was a critic of NAFTA. Every single Democrat who beat a Republican senator or who took an open seat said, NAFTA is bad for American workers, it is bad for American farmers, it is bad for Mexican workers, and Mexican farmers, it's bad for Canadian workers and Canadian farmers, NAFTA is bad. Every single one of those candidates said that, and every single one of them was elected. Opposition to NAFTA, militant, outspoken opposition to NAFTA is a winning political issue. It is the most powerful and useful political issue in our American politics today. And yet, we have a media and a political class that tells candidates not to go near it. Now, I'm going to tell you this as the most important thing I'll say to you today. As you watch the 2008 political process, as you watch the 2008 political process, don't get obsessed with the presidential race. Please don't get obsessed with the presidential race. It is Britney Spears versus O.J. Simpson. It is celebrity versus celebrity. It is compromise versus compromise. Do not get obsessed with the presidential race. Get obsessed with the fact that there is the potential to elect nine more U.S. senators on anti-NAFTA pro-fair trade stances. We have an open Senate race across this country, so many contests that progressives who are critical of NAFTA can win. I know it sounds incredible, but the fact of the matter is the United States Senate, which against NAFTA could only produce two dozen, only two dozen votes against NAFTA back in 1993, could well become a pro-fair trade Senate. And then it doesn't matter who the president is because the veto power is in the legislative process.
That is the hopeful news. If we focus, if we begin to get nuanced and focus on those down ticket, down ballot races, rather than obsessing with the presidential race, we have the potential to decide our fate without waiting for a president to ride in on a white horse and deliver us. Down ballot, Senate races, House races, these are the critical contests of 2008. And I will tell you, I will tell you that they are the place at which we begin the painful process of restoring democracy in the United States. It is a long and difficult struggle. And we gather, we gather here in Minneapolis in the point, at the point of the deepest and most painful moment in our recent history. I close by reminding you that you are in the state once represented in the United States Senate by Paul Wellstone. <laughs> Paul Wellstone, who never got a trade issue wrong, didn't have to figure it out, didn't have to be lobbied. He understood it when he got there. He came from an activist background, took that activism, took that engagement to Washington. He's one of you. He was one of you. He served there as one of you. Now, Wellstone thought very seriously about running for president in 2000. In fact, he came this close to doing it. It was only a bad back that pulled him out of the race. When I talked to him a couple days before the New Hampshire primary in 2000, I said, Paul, do you, are you sorry that you didn't run? Are you sorry that you didn't make the race? And he said, yeah, I am. And he said, why? I said, why, why, why are you sorry? He said, well, I don't mind Al Gore that much. I think someday he'll get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> don't mind Bill Bradley that much. He's a decent man. He says, but I wish I could be in those debates. Remember, this is the winter of 2000. He said, I wish I could be in those debates because I'd like to just get up there in front of the American people and say one word that our media doesn't say and that our politicians don't say. I'd like to just look at them and say, Seattle. Seattle, Seattle, the WTO, the protests in the streets, farmers, workers, crowds of people stopping the WTO, preventing it from going forward. I'd like to say Seattle was the beginning of a new American history. Seattle wasn't a global struggle, it was a American struggle. I'd like to stand there and turn the whole debate away from all these secondary issues, lock boxes and such, and take it, take it to Seattle. Take the political debate to Seattle, and I think the American people, the American people would come with it. And you know what? Paul Wellstone was exactly right. He understood exactly what needed to happen. He understood that Seattle is a shorthand for everything that we need to bring to this political process. Humanity, solidarity, engagement across borders, caring, for those who toil with their hands and their minds, caring across all the expanse of this planet and saying, another world is possible. Another politics is possible. And as you gather and speak and debate and consider in these next several days, I ask you to keep, keep in your heart and in your mind the memory of Paul Wellstone and understand understand that his vision, his belief that kids, children, could go into a street in a major city and block traffic and cause the World Trade Organization to come to a halt, and that that act was significant enough to change the politics of a nation and a world, that faith is an accurate faith that faith is a true faith. Another world is possible. Another politics is possible. Thank you very much.